This is the British Isles, 400 years ago. You will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. Mass trials and executions erupted across the country. And the reason for this chaos and violence was witches. Devil's whore! People were convinced they sank ships, brought famine and disease, murdered and maimed, because witches worked for Satan. <laughs> Hundreds of innocent people were persecuted, about a witch, tortured, and put to death in a hysterical effort to stamp out the scourge of witchcraft. Imagine living in that world. You could be accused, tortured, and executed on the basis of nothing more than gossip and superstition. How could such a deadly and violent idea have got so out of control in Britain? What drove the persecutors to such awful lengths? And what was it like for the victims who were tortured and executed for crimes they couldn't possibly have committed? Me. This is the extraordinary story of how the terror of satanic witchcraft on you. infected the British Isles and plunged it into chaos. ships had been battered by a violent storm. One ship sank, Anne's almost capsized. The badly damaged convoy had limped back to Scandinavia. King James decided he would have to go and fetch his new wife himself. But James would bring back far more than just a new queen from Denmark. James arrived here at Kromberg Castle near Copenhagen in January 1590. His crossing had been equally violent. The world James walked into was very different to his native Scotland. Witch hysteria was infecting mainland Europe. Hundreds had already been executed as witches Tens of thousands would follow. The violence, fear, and hysteria spreading across Europe were largely the result of one incendiary book. Here at the Royal Danish Library is one of the very few original copies. This is the Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of the Witches. It was principally written by one German Dominican monk called Heinrich Kramer, and he wrote it to argue that witches existed and that they worked for the devil. It was a legal manual for the hunting and executing of witches. The Malleus Maleficarum pushed Kramer's terrifying belief that witches were obsessed with poisoning, maiming, and killing, and they were doing it for Satan. Their aim was to harm, to murder and to destroy. And if witches were the problem, the Malleus was the answer. It was a hugely influential book. And one of the reasons it was so influential is printed at the front. This is a papal bull, the Pope's equivalent of a royal proclamation. It was issued in 1484, just before the Malleus was published. And it stated that witches were heretics who had made an alliance with the devil. Cramer reprinted the ball to prove that the church stood behind his book. Because it appeared to have the church's backing, the Malleus Maleficarum led to the wholesale torture and murder of thousands of people suspected of being in league with the devil. This idea that witches were the devil's handmaidens, hell-bent on death and chaos, 
hadn't yet reached James's kingdom. But in Denmark, he came face to face with the reality of Satan's witches. In April 1590, while James was still at Kronberg Castle, two witches were arrested in Copenhagen. And what was truly shocking was that they confessed to conjuring up the violent storms that had hit James and Anne's ships. They had attempted to murder the Scottish king and queen because Satan wanted them dead. At least five more witches were later convicted of the same crime. All were burned at the stake. But if James thought he'd left the scourge of witchcraft behind him when he returned to Scotland, he was wrong. With the Danish witches dead, the whole thing might have become nothing more than a historical footnote, and James might have lived out his reign untroubled by the devil, if it were not for one man. His name was David Seaton, and he was the deputy bailiff here in the small town of Trenant, nine miles east of Edinburgh. What Seaton did in November 1590 proved to James that the devil and his witches were alive and well in Scotland. He claimed his young housemaid, Gillis Duncan, had suddenly acquired healing powers, and he'd seen her slipping out at night. According to a contemporary source, Seaton believed only one thing could explain her furtive behavior, witchcraft. And he was going to prove it. Where have you been? I was tending to the garden, sir. Lie to me! Are thou a witch? No, sir. Please, sir, no. The story of Seton and Gillis is recorded in this pamphlet, first published in 1591. It's called News from Scotland, and it tells us exactly what Seton did next. Her master did, with the help of others, torment her with the torture of the pillywinks. No. 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 Pillywinks are thumbscrews. They crushed the flesh and bones of the fingers. Victims were often left permanently crippled. Are you a witch? <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Where'd you get the power to heal? It's not magic, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Gillis must have endured unbearable pain, but she would not confess to something that she had not done. <laughs> Seaton didn't stop at thumbscrews. Where'd you go at night? Tell me the truth. I won't stand any more of your lies. He turned instead to wrenching. As the rope was pulled tight, it crushed the head. It could fracture the skull and facial bones. Gillis would not yield. But the more she resisted confessing, the harder Seaton tried to break her. Confess, damn you! <laughs> I don't think Seaton's actions had much to do with witch hunting. I think his motives were sexual. Perhaps he'd lusted after her for a long time and felt that, as master, he had a right to have her. 
It doesn't take a huge leap to imagine that a young woman sneaking out at night might have been having a sexual liaison with someone other than Seaton. Whatever was driving him, I don't think that Seaton could possibly have appreciated the death and suffering that would result from his obsession. In Europe, King James VI had seen that witches working for the devil had been hell-bent on killing him. He was about to receive proof that this dangerous belief was infecting Scotland too. Tell me the truth. The man responsible was bailiff David Seaton. He was systematically brutalizing and torturing his housemaid, Gillis Duncan, to make her confess to being a witch. But Gillis would not yield. Seaton began to search her body because people believed the devil always left a mark on the bodies of his disciples. It could be anything, a mole, a birthmark. Seaton found what he was looking for on Gillis's neck. And for some reason, this is what broke her. All I've done is by witchcraft. And with the enticements of the devil himself, I rode to the town where a witch was received in service of the devil. I danced in the rank with the others. We'll never know why Gellis confessed now, after she'd resisted thumb screws and wrenching. Perhaps the mark was from a sexual liaison, and in this highly religious time, she felt too much shame and guilt. Gillis's confession had a seismic impact. It was the first recorded incident of a Scottish witch admitting to working for the devil. It set in train a sequence of events that would kill hundreds of people. The repercussions would last a hundred years. In November 1590, Gellis Duncan was brought here to the old Tolbooth prison, one of Edinburgh's most notorious jails. The old prison no longer stands, but what does remain is the stone heart of Midlothian that was at the doorway. Gellis would have walked over this heart as she entered her period of incarceration. Gillis admitted to being part of a coven. She gave up the names of eight other witches. They, in turn, named more. In total, over a hundred people were hunted down and tortured. This raised the stakes enormously. It was no longer an isolated case of witchcraft. It was now a conspiracy of witches. <coughs> Under torture, Gillis said that her coven had been in league with witches from Copenhagen. The ones who'd been executed for attempting to murder King James and his queen. This was dynamite. It changed everything. It got the king's full attention. And he did something almost unheard of. He became directly involved in the case. The person who had the most profound effect on King James was one of those named by Gillis Duncan, a woman called Agnes Sampson. Agnes was a midwife from Edinburgh. She was accused of being the most senior witch in the coven. And under torture, she too confessed to the attempted murder of King James. Agnes Sampson was taken down there to Holyrood House, James VI's official residence, not once, but twice to be directly interrogated by the king himself.
Agnes repeated the confession that had been beaten out of her in jail, that her coven had met with the devil. We met in the kirk at North Berwick. The plan was to raise a storm for staying of the Queen's coming home. He told me of the Michaelmas storm and that it would do great damage both at sea and land. He said it should be hard for the King to come home. The Queen should never come. James saw himself as a highly intellectual king. He read widely and was fascinated by both natural philosophy and the new ideas of rational investigation. Agnes's confession did not convince him. She's not but a liar. No lying, sire. According to James, Agnes repeated pillow talk between the king and his new bride on their wedding night, when they were alone. This was enough to convince him that Agnes must be a witch. It certainly sounded like magic, but whatever James may have believed, in reality, there was little privacy for a 16th century king, even in bed. Possibly a juicy piece of gossip escaped the palace. Or maybe the experienced midwife simply made an educated guess. But that leaves one big question. Why did Agnes go to such great lengths in order to seal her own fate? Possibly this lowly woman enjoyed her moment in the limelight. She had a chance to meet the king and maybe even scare him. But I think there may be a simpler explanation. It ended her torture. Agnes had been in prison in one of the worst jails in Scotland. She had been tortured, and she probably knew that this marked effectively the end of her life. So the best that she could hope for was to ease her suffering. And in that, at least, she was successful. James ordered that her torture should cease. In James's mind, there was now clear evidence that an international satanic conspiracy was out to kill him. And there was only one way to stop them, kill them first. On the 28th of January, 1591, Agnes Sampson was brought here to Castle Hill in Edinburgh to be executed. We don't know how many other convicted witches were with her that day, but we do know that she wasn't alone. These were innocent, confused and terrified people, people who had been imprisoned and tortured, people who had been prepared to say anything to stop the pain. All the victims were probably garroted before the fires were lit. It was considered a mercy. And compared to burning to death, it probably was. As the convicted witches burned, the air would have been thick with the stench of burning human fat. It would have seeped into the crowd's hair, their clothes, even the porous walls of the surrounding buildings. Of 200 people who'd been accused, around 70 had been found guilty of witchcraft and sentenced to death. Gillis Duncan, the young housemaid who started it all, rotted in prison for a further year, before she too was burnt at the stake. These events became known as the North Berwick Witch Trials. 
They convinced James that satanic witchcraft threatened his land and his life. And the king's personal involvement in the trials gave witch hunting the stamp of royal approval. Over the next few years, the infection spread across Scotland. In East Lothian, 62 people were accused, 33 in Fife, 86 in Aberdeen, and 11 in Ross. Few doubted that the devil and his handmaidens stalked the earth, at least in Scotland. Until now, England had largely escaped the curse of mass witchcraft trials. But on the 24th of March, 1603, Queen Elizabeth I died and her cousin James claimed the throne. James carried the witchcraft infection south to England. But how it happened was totally unexpected. high hopes for their new king. He was young, male, and already had a couple of sons as heirs. After 45 years of childless Queen Elizabeth I, it seemed too good to be true. But James was an unknown quantity, a foreign king in an alien land. His new subjects wanted to know what their new ruler was like, what were his interests, what were his beliefs, and which way was the wind blowing in this new regime? Well, they had one big clue. A book published in London, written by James himself. It was called Demonology. This is the only book ever written by a reigning monarch on the subject of witchcraft and the devil. James sets out his reason for writing in the preface. He says, the fearful abounding at this time in this country of these detestable slaves of the devil, the witches or enchanters, hath moved me, beloved reader, to dispatch in post this following treatise of mine. And the purpose of it, he says, is to resolve the doubting hearts of many. And this is pretty unequivocal stuff. What he's saying is that there are witches everywhere in Scotland, that they are Satan's minions, and that everyone better believe it. James sets the book out in the form of a dialogue between two characters. So we have Philomathes and Epistemon. Epistemon is the thoroughly knowledgeable one, the rational man who knows all about witchcraft, He's undoubtedly James himself. And over the course of the book, Epistemon convinces Philomathes that actually witches are real, that they should be prosecuted by the correct authorities, and that anyone who doubts their existence is at best fooling himself and at worst in league with the devil. The book was very popular with the English. It was republished in London at least twice. Demonology gave English people an insight into their new king. And what they saw was a man hell-bent on hunting down Satan's witches. And in 1605, James once again became involved in a case of witchcraft. But this time, in England. Here at Exeter College, Oxford, the country finally saw their new witch-hunting king taking on the satanic scourge. In August, a wealthy and well-connected man gained an audience with King James. His name was Brian Gunter. Gunter had a problem, a problem with a witch. Now, I think it's quite likely that Gunter had read James's book, Demonology. And this was enough to convince him that the king would share his hatred of witches. Gunter presented his daughter Anne to the king and claimed that she had been cursed by three witches. 
The affliction first beset her around midsummer. Her fits are violent, and her body contorts. And when she is in the throes, she vomits pins or pulls them from her nose. My daughter is bewitched, sire. Anne has seen her tormentors in her fits. The first is good wife Gregory. The second is Mary People. And the third is Mother Pepwell. Is this true? Yes, sir. Gunter wanted the king to bring the witches to justice. But James did something completely unexpected. James ordered that Anne be examined by the Archbishop of Canterbury, a noted skeptic. And it didn't take the Archbishop's team of investigators long to figure out that Anne was faking the symptoms. On the 10th of October, King James wrote to his chief minister about the case. For your better satisfaction touching Anne Gunter, we find by her confession that she was never possessed with any devil, that the practice of the pins grew at first from a pin that she put in her mouth, affirmed by her father. Brian Gunter was the brains behind the deception. He was seeking revenge against one of the accused, and he tried using James to get it. He was fined for wasting the king's time and thrown into jail for three years. He'd got off comparatively lightly. If he'd succeeded, the women would have been executed. Gunter had entirely misread the new king. King James's actions in the Gunter case seem completely at odds with his reputation as a rabid witch hunter. So what was really going on? I think the answer lies in his book, Demonology. If you read it, you're left in no doubt at all that James wholeheartedly believed in Satan and witches. But demonology is no malleus maleficarum. It's not trying to use fear to whip people up into a frenzy of witch hatred. It's an opportunity to make a case by rational argument rather than by mere superstition. It's designed as much to make sure the wrong people aren't convicted as the right people are. James was a philosopher, or at least that's how he saw himself. But the subtleties of his bookish ideas were almost certainly lost on most of his subjects. Like Brian Gunter, they probably took demonology at face value, a license from the king to hunt witches and kill them. This misunderstanding of James's ideas would light a touch paper that over the next hundred years would lead to the worst excesses of witch hunting in English history. Seven years after the Gunter incident, the era of mass witch trials exploded in the English courts. It began here in Pendle, Lancashire. On the 18th of March, 1612, a girl called Alison Device was near the town of Colne in Pendle when she spied an elderly peddler called John Law. Sarah Pinter. Alison didn't like being ignored. She cursed the peddler. description of John Law's condition, paralysis down the left side, loss of speech, it seems likely that he'd suffered a stroke. But from Alison's terrified point of view, it was her curse that had struck him down. Alison came from a family of cunning folk, local healers who used herbs and sometimes magic to cure people. 
so it would have been natural for her to believe in the power of her curse. Horrified by what she'd done, Alison Device confessed. She was hauled up in front of local magistrate, Roger Knoll. Alison admitted to cursing the peddler, but according to a report made at the time, she went much further. I demanded that the peddler let me buy some pins from him, and the peddler refused to open his pack. As I parted from him, there appeared a black dog. Black dog said unto me, what wouldst thou have me do unto yonder man? I said, what canst thou do unto him? And the black dog said, I can lame him. And I said, lame him. Alison accused her grandmother and two neighbours of being witches as well. Noel began arresting the suspects named by Alison. On the 2nd of April, Alison Device, her grandmother, Old Demdike, their neighbour, Old Chattox, and her daughter, Anne Redfern, were brought here to Lancaster Castle Prison. And they were kept in the bottom of this tower. It's still known as the Witch's Tower to this day. All the accused were interrogated. Eight further suspects, including all of Alison's family, joined them in the tower. This is the very cell where they were kept. And along with the 12 suspected witches, there were another eight, we know, prisoners who were unrelated to the witch trial. So that's 20 people in this space. It must be 12 foot by 17, 18 foot. Quite something to imagine that the suspected witches, just ordinary people, were kept in here for four months. I mean, some of them were very old, they're in the 80s. Others, people like Alison were as a teenager, and they were in here in the dark for all that time, awaiting their death. Noel probably couldn't believe his luck. A rural magistrate lived a humdrum life with few opportunities. Now Noel found himself heading up a high-profile witch hunt. If he secured convictions, this could make his career. But that was easier said than done. Of all the cases that made it to court, three quarters failed due to lack of evidence. All Noel had were accusations and counter-accusations. What he needed was proof. God, God, you! and it was King James who inadvertently gave it to him. The era of mass witch hunting in England led to the torture and murder of hundreds of people. It all began here on the 17th of August, 1612, with the prosecution of the Pendle Witches, one of the most infamous witch trials in English history. This is the site of the original courtroom in Lancaster Castle, where the Pendle Witches were tried. Although it's now a library, the courtroom has only shifted a few feet, just through here. The courtroom was a hive of activity. 
People packed the public gallery to see the sensational trial. The judge was Sir Edward Bromley. Roger Knoll was the prosecuting magistrate. A guilty verdict could be a huge boost to his career. Thomas Potts was the court clerk. And we know the detail of this trial because he later published his records in this book. Over the next two days, 19 suspects stood trial, accused of using witchcraft to harm or kill. This should have been 20, but Alison's grandmother, old Demdike, had already died in that cramped and stinking cell in the witch's tower. I demanded that the peddler let me buy a pin off him, but the peddler refused. Unfortunately, Alison Device felt such remorse for cursing the peddler that she didn't even try to defend herself. So I said, blame him. She repeated her confession and was quickly found guilty. Devil's the next to take the stand was Alison's mother, Elizabeth Device. You are accused. The Good Friday passed. You dined at Moking Tower with persons you knew to be witches. At your meeting together, you talked about killing the constable and blowing up Lancaster Castle. I deny any such meeting or talk. Your spirit, Paul, did appear to you in the form of a black dog. Black said spirit bid you to make a picture in clay after the said John Robinson, which you then did burn with fire and crumble. Huh? That is not true. The case was deadlocked between accusation and denial. But Roger Knoll had a secret weapon. Elizabeth Device's own daughter, nine-year-old Janet. My mother is a witch. Curse on you! Curse on you! What are you saying? Why are you saying this? You stupid girl, do you not know what you do? Shut up, girl! Shut up! Silence! No! A demon will come for thou and ravage thy mind! I will snuff out thy children with my own bare hands! Silence! I cannot speak with my mother here. Take her out! A curse on you! No! The testimony of a child would not normally be allowed under English law. But King James's book, Demonology, promoted its use in witch trials. And because of that, Janet's confession was accepted. And the fate of the witches was sealed. My mother is a witch, and that I know to be true. I've seen her spirit many times in the likeness of a brown dog that she called Ball. And at one time, I did see Ball ask Mother what she would have him to do. And Mother answered that she would have Ball to help her kill. Little Janet, named names. The wife of Hugh Hargraves, Christopher Howellgate, Elizabeth his wife, Dick Miles and his wife, Christopher Ajax of the Thorny Hole and his wife, and my brother, James Device, 
has been a witch for three years. We'll never know why Janet testified against her own family. Maybe she thought they really were witches. Maybe she liked being the centre of attention. Or maybe given the way that her mother shouted at her and threatened her in court, she was badly treated and she thought that this was an escape. But I suspect the nine-year-old didn't understand the full consequences of what she said. And maybe Noel bullied and brainwashed her into saying what she did, just as Brian Gunter had done. At the end of a two-day trial, 10 of the 19 accused were found guilty of witchcraft. Janet's entire family was convicted. You will be taken to the execution grounds for this country, where you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy upon your souls. On the 20th of August, the day after the trial, the 10 convicted witches were brought here to a place still known as Gallows Hill to be hanged. Perhaps under similarly grim skies, the crowds would have gathered to see the spectacle, to see the old, unloved, despised witches meet their fate. And maybe amongst them, there would have been the young girl who had condemned her family, her own mother, to meet the rough rope and the short drop. It was a gruesome form of execution. The drop wasn't high enough to break their necks. Instead, they died by agonizingly slow strangulation. Janet disappears from the historical records after the trial, but the name Janet Device is listed as one of a group of 20 witches tried in Lancaster 22 years later. It appears that she was convicted and probably died in jail. We can't be sure if it was the same girl, but it would be a cruel form of poetic justice if it was. The Pendle trials were a watershed. They triggered a hundred years of institutionalized murder in England. And the blame for that must lie, at least partly, with King James. His book, Demonology, sanctioned forms of evidence and torture that drove the worst excesses of witch hunting. He would have been mortified. Pendle was everything the rational James disliked, a case based on hearsay, manipulation, and petty jealousies, rather than based on scripture, evidence, and due process of law. James knew it was as terrible a thing to condemn the innocent as to let the guilty go unpunished, and he'd written demonology as a manual to prevent precisely that. But James failed to grasp how other people would see a book written by the king on the prosecution of witches. And over the next 50 years or so, this misjudgment would lead to hundreds of innocent people being sentenced to death. Next time, witch hunting brings terror to England. Not just of witches, but of the man who was hunting them down. Is somebody there? Welcome to the world of the Witchfinder General. Tell me the truth.